You're listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. Hey everybody, Big Anglovich here. Uh, I know you just heard from us yesterday, but we've got a special uh, bonus podcast for you today. A special bonus story. Um, no Rish Outfield or uh, R080T today. Rish has uh, already left for the holidays to see his family in Hoboken, and uh, 080T has already uh, gone back to the uh, Cyberdyne factory to uh, visit his family. So it's just me today. Um, I have a very special podcast for you today. It's it's kind of a Christmas gift podcast. My wife was cleaning out our room this week, and she came across an old story by Rish Outfield. So I took a look at this story, and it was a Christmas story, and it was written by Rish, who is always, and I'm, I'm sure you've heard him, you know, we play the sad music, and he cries about how he writes stories, and, and nobody likes them. And uh, he sends them off, and, and they're always rejected. So I thought for Christmas, it would be nice to do a Rish Outfield story. Now, this story was titled, Untitled Santa Tale 2004. Um, I figured I'd go ahead and give it a, uh, a title myself. Uh, after all, he's titled enough of my stories before in the past that can't hurt him to be titled by me. So I gave it a title, and I was going to record it, and then I had another thought. And I thought, oh, what better for a gift to Rish Outfield than to have the, have the story read by none other than one of his favorite podcasters of all time, Norm Sherman. So I got a hold of Norm Sherman, who uh, we'd just done some stuff with for the Drabblecast, which we were real excited about. And now, w- even more amazing, Norm Sherman has done some stuff for us. I'm so excited to put this out there and to give this to Rish as a special Christmas present. So, Rish, here's your story. It's not called Untitled Santa Tale anymore. It's now called... Naughty or Nice by Rish Outfield. Ho, ho, ho. And ten o'clock finally arrived. Thank God. Chris Lingman had closed down the line at 930 Otherwise, there might not have been an end to the line of snot-nosed, smelly brats begging me for junk. I stood up, hearing my knees popping from a long day of sitting in the Santa chair. There were still a couple of shoppers wandering about, but my work was done. It was the Saturday before Christmas, and all through the store, I had gotten really sick of the holidays. I had heard Brookhart's department store was in need of a Santa Claus from Riley Lingman, a drinking buddy whose brother Chris was the assistant manager. Blessed, or cursed, with a lot of fat and not a lot of hair, I looked the part to Chris and got the job. It didn't pay a hell of a lot, but it seemed like easy work at the time. Boy, was I wrong. I'd been doing it eight hours a day since the 17th, and in that time I'd been puked on, peed on, cried on, drooled on, sneezed on, beard pulled, slapped, licked, and kicked in the balls twice by kids who'd surely get everything they wanted anyway. And today I'd been here since 11 in the morning, with barely a break to stretch my aching back, asking, And what do you want for Christmas? So many times it didn't even sound like English anymore. Chris had approached me about doing it again next year, but I'd have to do some serious drinking between now and then to even consider it. Hey, Santa, a woman's voice said. I turned, expecting to see Maria the Elf, who was somehow almost as fat as I was, She helped the little bastard sit on my lap and gave them a candy cane. But it wasn't her. The woman standing in front of me was a young, blonde thing, five foot nothing and grinning. She had the body of a pole dancer, barely clad in a halfway unbuttoned western shirt and stonewashed jeans at least three sizes too tight. Her dark, little eyes were too close together, making her look a bit like a woodchuck. She was the sexiest girl I'd ever laid eyes on. Hey, I said, a moment late. You, uh, got a kid you want me to meet? No, sir, she said, her high, quiet voice making me think of farm girls and what's-her-name on the Beverly Hillbillies. I seen you talking to the kids and wondered if you might want to get some drinks with me. My jaw suddenly felt too heavy to stay shut. I, uh... Unless you gotta get back to the North Pole, she said, pronouncing North Nauth. Or you don't drink? 
Oh, I, <laughs> I drink, I said, sounding like an idiot but not giving a damn. It was hard enough to keep my eyes on her face, let alone think straight. Then let's go, she said, putting out her elbow for me to take. Give me a minute to change, I said, heading toward the break room. Don't change, Santa. I like your uniform. All right, I said. So she had some kind of Santa fetish. Didn't hurt me none. I, uh, I gotta clock out first, I said. I'll wait for you in the parking lot. My name's Tiffany, but I suppose you knew that. I didn't know how I could. If I had seen her before, I would have remembered. Sure enough, she was standing there by the front doors, looking hot in the freezing cold. She showed me to her pickup truck and I climbed aboard. She started the engine and waited for the heater to kick in. She turned towards me. Santa? Um, yes? Do you really know who's been naughty and nice? She leaned in like it was a secret. I could smell beef jerky on her. And it struck me. She hadn't asked me where I was from. She hadn't asked what I did for a living. She hadn't even asked me my name. Did she really think that I was Santa Claus? That, um, only works on kids, I told her. Oh, she exclaimed, seeming very relieved at that news. Uh, why? Have you been naughty? Oh, very naughty, Santa, Tiffany said. I hope you'll still come down my chimney. Yikes. We hit a bar with fewer people, lights, and smoke than the one I usually went to. As we walked in, I regretted not taking her to Red's Club, where all the boys could have seen me with Tiffany on my arm. They'd never believe me otherwise. We sat down and I ordered a round. She pounded it down and let out a roar like a freight train. A man could fall in love. You hungry, Santa? Tiffany asked me. No, I, uh, I had a big steak earlier. I nudged her. A venison steak? She frowned. That's not funny. Oh, I was just, I'm sorry. So maybe she was a vegetarian. The drinks arrived and disappeared just as quickly. She bought me a round and I returned the favor. This was shaping up to be the best night of my life. And just an hour earlier, I was sweating inside that department store, hating Christmas with all of my might. I was unsteady as we made our way out of the bar, but leaned on her a little more than was necessary. She didn't complain. If anything, she was more forward than I was. You want to hit my place? She asked as we walked through the snow to her truck, and for a very brief moment, I wondered if that was such a good idea. I mean... How crazy was she? But my eyes fell to the front of her blouse, and I turned it into a nod. Sounds good, I said, and we hopped into the pickup. She drove me to a neighborhood I'd never seen before, one way over on the old side of town, where every yard was huge and filled with trees. I don't know how long we drove, really, since I was sort of sleepy, but when we pulled up to a big house, I was impressed. It looked like the sort of place your grandparents had grown up in, with woodwork and gabled windows and trim. Your place? You know it is, silly, she said. You used to bring me presents here. This time she sounded a bit doubtful, and I wondered if the game was wearing thin for her. Right. I hesitated a moment after getting out of the truck. My fake beard was itching. Something wasn't right. Tiffany came around and held out her hand. I took it. Her hands were rough and cold. Let's go in, she said. I followed. The door wasn't locked and there were lights on. The house was too big for one person. Your, uh, family live here with you? Uh-huh, she said. She closed the door behind her. It was chilly in the house, and the walls were lined with shipping boxes and junk-filled apple crates. Pack rats, huh? Cold, I observed. This house has been here a long, long time. 
said Tiffany. I don't doubt it. Well, we could go out in the back porch and warm up. I thought I'd heard her wrong. On the back porch? She grinned, again looking like a cute little animal. A ferret, maybe. I'll make some hot chocolate. I followed her into the kitchen. It was also cluttered with tons of junk. She was acting stranger now, and I didn't know where I was or how to get back. So, what are the elves like? Tiffany asked, heating up milk in an ancient-looking microwave. Oh, I, I don't know, I said, feeling less and less drunk all the time. She brought a cup over to me and placed it in my hand. Careful, it's hot, she said, and went through the kitchen to the back door. Are you sure you want to go outside? But she was already out there. I followed. There was darkness as far as the eye could see. We were out in the middle of nowhere. I've been wanting to ask you something, she said sexily. Okay. You're not the real Santa Claus, are you? Though the whole situation was nutty, that was cute. She seemed like such a child, I really couldn't help but smile. No, my name's Tommy. Well, that's a relief, she sighed and flipped on the backyard light. And I saw the graves. There were headstones in the backyard, some old and crumbling, some new and ornate, all going off into the distance. There were other mounds there, too, unmarked. That was it. I had to get the hell out of here. But what could I say? This was beyond weird. But I didn't have time to say anything. At that moment, two men came running out from behind the trees. They were huge, ugly men with familiar rodent-like eyes, wearing filthy butcher's aprons. One held a meat cleaver, the other a hacksaw. I turned to Tiffany. What's going on? But she was already swinging the hatchet toward me. Ho, ho, ho. Okay, thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the story, especially you, Rish. I hope you listened to it, and I hope you'd enjoyed it. I hope you liked Norm's reading. I actually did, at one point, record a female to read the female parts, and as usual, uh, as per the way things go here on the Dune Steve, I accidentally deleted that file and have no copy of it anywhere. So I went ahead and let Norm's reading stand alone for itself. It's amazing. He's great as is. So we just let it go with that. So there you have it. Merry Christmas to everybody, and I hope you enjoyed this uh, very special extra edition of the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. Have a Merry Christmas. See you later, folks. Thank you for listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. The Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine is published under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. This means that you may share these files with anyone, but you may not charge for them or alter them. This means that you can share the Dune Steve with anyone you'd like, but you can't sell or change the files. Ho, ho, ho.